the different terrace levels are from different advances. The different terrace levels are different advances of the Yakima Valley Glacier. <coughs> Here we go. Welcome to the Quincy Basin. This is the Winchester Wasteway Rest Area. Seriously, are we doing a show here? Where's the geology? Yeah, there's great agriculture here. If we get to the right scale, the Quincy Basin becomes alive. And it's a major player in the geology of Washington, here between Moses Lake and Vantage. All right, here we go. It's got to be You're quicker. On the right, man. Good. Hey, welcome to the Quincy Basin. This is the Winchester Wasteway Rest Area. Are we really doing a show here? Where's the geology? In the middle of all this agriculture in a flat freeway stretch, there is geology. We just need the right scope, the right field of view. This is a broad story. And the Quincy Basin is part of a major geologic story in Eastern Washington. What do Dry Falls, the Grand Coulee, Frenchman Coulee, and Drumheller Channels have in common? The Quincy Basin episode of I-90 Rocks. Let's get started. Try it once, really getting rolling quick, and then getting into... Um, the Mizzle's kind of a slow buildup. Okay. Hey, welcome to the Quincy Basin. This is the Winchester Wasteway Rest Area. Are we really doing a geology show here? There's nothing to look at, is there? It's just agricultural fields. But there is something going on here, a major story involving the Quincy Basin. If we pull our scope back a little bit and look at the basin as a whole, we've got Dry Falls, the Grand Coulee, Frenchman Coulee, Drumheller Channels. They all have something in common, the Quincy Basin episode of I-90 Rocks. Let's get started. And what if it's a whole bunch of water pouring in here and then the water pouring out? And mention the Grand Coulee so they know, or do you want to save it we all? We can do it. No, we can do it. Hey, welcome to the Quincy Basin. This is the Winchester Wasteway Rest Area. My God, what are we doing out here? Are we really doing a geology show next to I-90 in a flat stretch of agriculture? Yes. The Quincy Basin is a major player in Eastern Washington geology. And we had unimaginable amounts of water coming down the Grand Coulee over Dry Falls into this basin and then the water left. Throw in Frenchman Coulee and Drumheller Channels and what have you got? The Quincy Basin episode of I-90 Rocks. Let's get started. That works, but do it again how you want. Go back to your build-up one. Okay. Hey, welcome to the Quincy Basin. This is the Winchester Wasteway rest area. Are we really seriously doing a geology program here? It's a boring stretch through a bunch of agricultural fields. Is there anything to look at? There is. The Quincy Basin, if viewed as a whole, is a major part of a very geologically exciting story. The Grand Coulee, Dry Falls, Frenchman Coulee, Drumheller Channels, what do they all have in common? The Quincy Basin episode of I-90 Rocks. Let's get started. That's good. Any mention of the basalt, that it's underneath us and you can't see it. Sure. Welcome to the Quincy Basin. This is the Winchester Wasteway Rest Area. It's about as flat as can be. There's no rocks to look at. Are we really doing a show here? Yes. The Quincy Basin, if viewed as a whole, is a significant part of some of the most exciting geology in eastern Washington. Basalt bedrock beneath us, water coming down the Grand Coulee over Dry Falls, crazy amounts of water coming into this basin and then leaving. Throw in Frenchman Coulee and Drumheller Channels and you've got a heck of an episode and that's what we're going to start right now. The Quincy Basin episode of I-90 Rocks. That'll work. Okay. <laughs> Hi, this is Nick Zetner in Ellensburg, Washington. This is Remembering Tom Foster, I-90 Rocks. This is part three 
of three videos remembering Tom, who we lost in March of 2020. And here we are in the first few days of the year 2021, and I'm still looking back and remembering the very close collaboration that I had with Tom Foster. And I hope that you had a chance to see parts one and parts two. Uh, part one was looking at two-minute geology episodes that we created back in 2012, and part two was looking at longer feature-length videos that Tom was creating for the Columbia River Gorge and uh, Glacial Lake Missoula, etc. What you're looking at here is the Space Needle at Vantage, Washington. That's unusual, but Tom had ideas on how we could communicate geology along the Interstate 90 corridor for people outside of the area. That's a map of the freeway, the U.S. freeway called Interstate 90, that's a five-hour drive from west to east between Seattle, Washington and Spokane, Washington. And what we're looking at right here is a nine-minute collage that Tom put together. He sent it to me and said, could you write a script for our Vantage segment of the I-90 Rock series using these video clips and stills and other things? So we were to the point, uh, after a few years of working together very, very closely, uh, this was kind of how we'd evolved. Uh, now he has the vi visuals that he wants to use, and he's sending them to me to write a script. And um, that's kind of how things were going. So the system was working beautifully at this point, and we were able to create episodes of this I-90 Rock series um, pretty efficiently, I must say. So I'm going to let this run here. There's no sound to this. This is, again, just kind of a draft of Tom bringing things uh, to my attention. I think this is an animation at Vantage where he has, yes, some Ice Age flood water, some brown water coming from the Grand Coulee or coming down the Columbia and flooding Vantage and bringing ice rafted erratics, for instance. So he clearly had the vision, he had the photos, he had, went out and got all the video stuff on his own, and then it was my job to come up with some words and some interesting scientific thoughts. Uh, to add to his visuals. Tom Tabbert is flying there with an ultralight. He was from Spokane. So, uh, wow, what a shot um, at the Vantage Bridge. So this is more than a couple of minutes of this kind of draft mm -hmm. stuff, but I, I, I feel like it, it shows Tom in a wonderful light and he was at the height of his powers as far as I'm concerned, even going back to the archives now and looking at old photos from the Vantage area. So the concept was nine videos getting us from Seattle to Spokane, and I'm happy to report that we did finish the first three. There was a Seattle show, I-90 Rocks, a Seattle to Snoqualmie Pass, kind of going through Issaquah, North Bend, episode of I-90 Rocks, and then we did a, and finished a Snoqualmie Pass episode of I-90 Rocks. And I have all three of those for you to see momentarily. Uh, but we, we stopped. We didn't, we didn't have more uh, put together and finished. Uh, but there were different levels of construction. Uh, the episodes at Cleellum, for instance, the episode at Ellensburg, the episode at Vantage, again, we're looking at the visuals for that, a Quincy Basin episode, and eventually getting over to Spokane. Uh, those were filmed out in the field. Uh, Tom had the visuals uh, together. Um, it just didn't happen. We just didn't finish that series. And so what do I have for you today in this uh, third part of the Tom Foster trilogy? Um I have unaired footage like this that we're looking at, again from the Vantage episode. I have the three finished I-90 Rocks videos that are available at Tom's YouTube channel, Huge Floods YouTube channel. But I also have outtakes. I have uh, give uh, portions of this series that have never been aired, uh, but I wanted to... I felt like this third video was important to show more of Tom's work, 
how he had evolved to the point where he had everything working, both video and stills and uh, aerial photographs or video from Tom Tabbert, making it all work together. In fact, Tabbert flew that specifically for us over this I-90 series. And what we opened with there, where I was trying different things at the chalkboard, I, I selected that to start so that you could see how Tom was pulling out um, the best in me. He was he was a taskmaster in a sense, uh, but he he was listening very carefully to every take. That's a rarity, by the way. If you have camera people, they're usually just focused on their instruments. But he was. Uh, always listening very carefully. And if I misspoke just for a second, he's like, oh, let's try it again. I don't, I don't think I like that one. So he was uh, challenging me to, to be the best that I could be. And we had plenty of chances to go out and think about this I-90 Rock series. What we're going to start with here, after we're done with this uh, uh, Vantage sample series, is a couple of short videos where we just started to play with the idea and Tom was thinking about how he wanted to do this I-90 series. So there's a couple of short I-90 episodes. They're kind of almost test versions, although he did post those, both shot in Kittitas County, which is right here near Ellensburg, Washington. But then you'll see the Seattle the Issaquah and the Snoqualmie Pass episodes of I-90 Rocks that perhaps some of you have seen already. And then we'll finish out this part three by looking at footage that was under construction as we were trying to complete this series of I-90 Rocks going from Seattle to Spokane. I said a little bit of this in the last episode, but I want to thank you all for leaving such um, beautiful comments, heartwarming comments. Uh, I'm especially happy to see all the photography type folks who can see the, there we go, more animation, we can see the, the details and the structure and the composition, stuff that I don't know anything about. So I was interested to see what photographers enjoyed about Tom's work. And I'm out of photos of Tom. He liked to stay behind that lens. So I've shared already what I have of Tom in front of the camera, just with a couple of snapshots here and there. But I'm hoping that you can um, still enjoy this much of this unaired material. I'd like to finish this little, uh, more than a little, uh, voiceover with a quick story that got me really motivated to share Tom's work with you here at the end of 2020. Ten years ago, when I got into a little bit of support to create a new video series just on my own, I shared the idea with Tom, and he immediately latched on to the idea and said, I think we could do that. I think if we get a video camera and a microphone, I can get some editing software, I can teach myself all this stuff, and it would be fun to make this together. That's Tom talking. And he immediately brought up the name Ian Stewart, who's from Scotland and the BBC. And I got an email from Ian Stewart out of the blue two weeks ago. And he said, I'm a big fan, especially of Two Minute Geology. And Tom was talking about Ian Stewart 10 years ago as his role model for doing this sort of thing. So... Full circle moment, Ian Stewart, Tom Foster, I-90 Rocks. Thank you for watching. Let's enjoy Tom's work. east of Kittitas, near the old Milwaukee Railroad trestle. The freeway rolls through Johnson Canyon here, but look carefully at milepost 119. It's going to go by quick. A brilliant white layer just above the creek bed. What is it? 
There are plenty of white layers this side of Snoqualmie Pass. Is it diatomite, a lake bed deposit made of microscopic hard-shelled algae? How about caliche, a hard pan mineral deposit below soil level? Or maybe a volcanic mud flow like we saw back at Thorpe? Nope, this is volcanic ash, blown down wind from the Cascades. This is not just any ash, this is the famous Mazama ash from southern Oregon. A Mount Rainier-like volcano, Mount Mazama, blew itself up 7,700 years ago and left Crater Lake National Park. That's 300 miles from here. Ash from the mountain spread over the Pacific Northwest, 43 times more ash than the Mount St. Helens blanket in 1980. In this creek bed, the Mazama ash is four inches thick, and the 1980 St. Helens ash is less than a quarter inch of ash. Think how much trouble we had in 1980 with a quarter inch. How did the local Native Americans deal with four inches? The Mazama ash is king out here. No other ash bed rivals its regional thickness. A useful time marker used across the Pacific Northwest. There's even Mazama ash in seafloor cores off the coast of Washington. The Columbia River hauled the ash out there. On the seabed, sitting above the Mazama ash are 13 sandy deposits that were created by 13 tsunami triggering magnitude nine earthquakes that struck repeatedly over the last 7,700 years. Here at Johnson Canyon, the Mazama has quiet deposits on top of it. This is loose, wind-blown silt sitting on top of the Mazama. But a newly discovered fault that has broken the Mazama ash bed here means young magnitude seven earthquakes have jolted eastern Washington since the ice age. I-90, after dropping into the beautiful Kittitas Valley near the Thorpe Fruit and Antique Barn. Look north at milepost 98, across those hay fields to the white cliffs where the Yakima River has cut a canyon through some thick white rock layers. There's plenty of sandstone in this part of Washington, but not here. These are volcanic mud flows. 10 million years old. Laharge from an extinct volcano. And you might be surprised to hear where that volcano used to stand. Notice the big cascade rocks floating in the middle of the deposit. Fragile chunks of white pumice. No sorting of the rocks by size that you'd see in a sandstone or river deposit. This thing formed quickly. No time for the big rocks to settle out. Three lahars are exposed in this cliff, but there's a total of 15 lahars in a stack of light-colored layers here, totaling 1,000 feet thick. Lahars form when cone-shaped volcanoes erupt. During the eruption, the flank of the volcano fails. Water and glacial ice in the landslide mix with rock to convert the landslide into a volcanic mud flow, like a slurry of wet concrete. Lahars follow river valleys and are deadly to those in their path. The lahars have been clocked at up to 80 miles per hour and can be up to hundreds of feet thick, stretching from valley wall to valley wall. Remember the Duwamish River entering the Puget Sound in one of our first episodes back in Seattle? The Duwamish drains an area between Seattle and Mount Rainier. 
5,600 years ago, a Mount Rainier that was 1,500 feet taller than today erupted, and the northeast flank of the mountain failed. The massive Osceola mud flow, a 400 foot thick lahar that surged 50 miles per hour down the White River, poured into the Puget Sound 60 miles from the mountain. Fine sands from the Osceola have been redeposited as far north as where the Duwamish River enters the Sound in downtown Seattle. More than 150,000 people now live on the Osceola Lahar, and Mount Rainier, an active volcano, has rebuilt itself and is poised for its next eruption. So are these volcanic mud flows at Thorpe from Mount Rainier? They're not. If you go upstream on the Yakima River from here, you don't head towards Mount Rainier. And besides, these volcanic deposits here are heading a different direction. These mud flows extend to the southwest, beneath hay fields, beneath I-90 and continue all the way to the William O. Douglas Wilderness Area, west of Yakima. Ten million years ago, a cone-shaped volcano erupted near White Pass, and a river valley once flowed northeast from the White Pass area to here in Thorpe. There's a buried river valley underneath Interstate 90 at milepost 98. Since ten million years ago, a series of ridges have uplifted south of I-90. The old river is gone. The old volcano is gone. The Lahar is at Thorpe, striking evidence for just one of many extinct volcanoes in the Cascades. Welcome to Seattle, Washington. This is an amazing place for geology. What's beneath that noisy stadium? It's a long way down to bedrock. The bedrock here has been buried by more than a thousand feet of muds, sands, gravels that were dumped here by ancient ice sheets, distant volcanoes, old lakes and rivers, even by early residents of Seattle. And there's an earthquake fault here, a big one. It's all right here. There's lots to learn. You ready? It's game time. Dig into most of Seattle's hills and you'll find complicated sets of poorly sorted rocks and beds of sand and gravel that were dumped here by an ice sheet that came from Canada. The Puget Lobe advanced and retreated over Seattle at least seven times in the last two million years. Each ice advance laid down a different generation of glacial till. Canadian rocks strewn all over the Puget Lowland, stretching from the Olympic Peninsula clear over to the Cascade Range. Deposits that were first mapped in detail by J. Harlan Bretz back in 1913. Kind of hard not to notice a boulder like this, right? Glacial erratics carried in ice from the north. The most recent advance began 25,000 years ago in British Columbia. Ice crossed the border 19,000 years ago and made it as far south as Tenino, Washington by 16,900 years ago. That was just yesterday geologically. The glacier was 3,000 feet thick over Seattle. Yep, I said 3,000 feet thick. Ice that was three Columbia centers high. The weight of the ice caused the crust to sag by as much as 300 feet. Since 16,000 years ago, Seattle has been ice-free and the crust has rebounded, but the blanket of glacial deposits remain. Almost 75% of Seattle's surface deposits were laid down by the most recent ice advance, Bedrock here is hard to find. Only 3% of the Seattle area has exposed bedrock at the surface. 
steeply dipping sandstones in a sea of loose glacial rocks. Bluffs throughout the Puget Sound reveal complexly interbedded glacial and interglacial deposits, and Seattle's famous rain makes these deposits especially prone to landslides, sometimes with tragic results. As it flowed south, the Puget Lobe acted like a comb running over the landscape, sculpting graceful, elongated, north-south-oriented hills called drumlins. Beacon Hill, First Hill, Capitol Hill, Queen Anne Hill, Mercer Island, they're all drumlins, one of the very few drumlin fields in all North America. Have you driven here in Seattle? The traveling's easy going north and south along drumlin tops or through valley bottoms, but driving east or west here means you're going against the lay of the land. When east-west streets are necessary, steep climbs are in order. Interstate 90 cuts across the grain, one of the most expensive stretches of our country's interstate system. The freeway tunnels through drumlins and uses bridges to span Ice Age troughs between the drumlins. As you leave Seattle on I-90, you skirt around the north end of one drumlin and then drive through the next one. Then a floating bridge over a trough, then crossing another drumlin. Talk about obstacles! If these tunnels were magically lined with glass walls, we'd see blue clays at the base, sorted sands and gravels in the middle, and poorly sorted glacial till at the top. During its march over Seattle, the advancing Puget Lobe, a 3,000-foot-high bulldozer, was an on-the-move broad apron of rocks and dirt that blocked north-flowing rivers. As the Strait of Juan de Fuca was blocked by the Puget Lobe, the Puget Sound filled with a massive lake, and for hundreds of years, clay settled to the bottom. At its peak, the glacial lake was 120 feet higher than current sea level. As the ice pushed south, its outwash plain deposited rocks and sand over the clay. Eventually, the glacier overrode these layers, and when the climate warmed, the ice dropped the poorly sorted rocks that it was carrying. Imagine Colombian mammoths roaming the scene. Another mammoth tusk was recently discovered beneath downtown Seattle, a long-ago tranquil Ice Age scene that now is just a little bit different. Seattle's shoreline in the 1850s was very different than today. A winding freshwater Duwamish River, Seattle's only river, used to meet and mix with salt water at the southern end of Elliott Bay. Fine sands in the Duwamish were washed to Seattle from the front of impressive volcanic mudflows, lahars, from a still active Mount Rainier on the horizon. The most recent major lahar from Rainier was 2,200 years ago. Seattle's first white settlers arrived at Alki Point in November of 1851, surrounded by steep hills under a dense forest. The trees, up to 2,000 years old and towering up to 400 feet, loved the climate and the soils. A few months later, the settlers took an Indian canoe, a clothesline, and a bunch of horseshoes out into Elliott Bay to see if it was deep enough to serve as a harbor. The harbor passed the test, and in 1853, plats were filed to establish a new town called Seattle. Down at the Tide Flats, this place was mud and salt water, a popular food-gathering spot for local Native American tribes. The mud flats only visible during low tide twice a day. It was a quiet, natural place with birds, salmon, and acres of clams. It's not quiet anymore. These football fans have been so loud, they've registered on local seismic stations. None of this was here in the 1850s. And I'm not talking about the stadium, I'm talking about there was no land here. In 1895, just a few years after a devastating citywide fire, Seattle city leaders announced a bold new civic project to radically alter the city's roller coaster topography. Hills would be removed 
and the dirt would be dumped onto the tidelands. Seattle needed new flat areas to grow. Horse-drawn wagons were lined up to accept dirt from neighboring hills and delivered the earth to the tide flats. Then more creative and efficient solutions emerged. The hills were washed directly into the bay using sluicing equipment, a mixture of soil and water that was shot into large chutes for transport directly over land and into the bay. No blasting was needed, right? They weren't dealing with bedrock. Eventually, the regrade project was perfected to the point of using conveyor belts. Not everybody loved this hill-moving business. There were some holdouts. Folks that elected not to participate were left stranded on what became known as spite mounds. All told, 60 regrades dumped millions of tons of earth from Seattle's hills, creating almost 3,000 acres of new land. Interstate 5, that runs along the base of Beacon Hill, traces the original saltwater shoreline. Hills flattened, rivers rerouted, shorelines extended. Seattle is one of the most dramatically engineered cities in the country. If we drill at the 50-yard line in Seahawks Stadium, we would encounter 40 feet of man-made fill and more than 1,000 feet of Ice Age sediments before we hit bedrock. But at nearby Alki Point, that same bedrock is at the surface. What's going on here? The Seattle Fault, an east-west crack in the bedrock that runs from Bainbridge Island all the way to Issaquah, lurks beneath the Puget Sound and downtown Seattle. The fault has produced at least four earthquakes in the past 3,500 years, and there is concern for future magnitude 7 earthquakes here. It's a thrust fault with a 35-degree dip to the south. There's been more than 5,000 feet of offset on the fault over the last 15 million years. My God, how many earthquakes are we talking about here to produce that kind of offset? Plate tectonic forces responsible for past Seattle Fault earthquakes continue to squeeze the crust here. The San Andreas Fault, an active fault in California, is visible from the space station due to millions of years of motion and erosion that have etched out an obvious gash across the land. The Seattle Fault might be just as active, but our glacier wiped the slate clean less than 20,000 years ago and then dumped a thick layer of sand and gravel on top. All of that loose material makes it tough to unravel in earthquake history. The most recent earthquake on the Seattle Fault struck in the year 900 AD, a bedrock platform visible today at Restoration Point, an Alki Point, was formerly under the waves of the Puget Sound and is now high and dry above the tides. All of the bedrock south of the fault jumped up suddenly 20 feet during the earthquake. Seattle sits on loose glacial sediment and bay fill. Properly placed fill with the right materials can be strong, but in south downtown, the city founders put just about anything in there as fill without any engineering considerations. Sawdust, wood chips, demolished building materials, asphalt, cinders, even garbage. Combined with the regrade hill materials, that's a 40-foot layer of fill. This stadium sits atop the worst possible soils in earthquake country. Seismic waves get trapped in basins with soft sediment and are prone to shaking like a bowl full of jello. The soft stuff shakes twice as hard as bedrock during earthquakes. Piles for the stadiums. Over 1,700 steel pipes up to 90 feet long were driven 50 feet into highly compacted, glacially overridden deposits. This is a modern stadium built to current seismic standards, one of the safest structures in the region. Looking to the future, Puget Sound bluffs will continue to fail as landslides. Future Mount Rainier mudflows could easily reach Seattle. Magnitude 9 megaquakes strike every 500 years off of Washington's coast. Is that a more likely seismic threat to the city than the Seattle Fault that lies beneath? There's so much geology here in Seattle, but we're just getting started. 
on our next episode of I-90 Rocks. Let's jump on the freeway and head east, the 30 miles between Seattle and the foothills of the Cascades. Thanks for watching. Interstate 90, crossing Lake Washington on a floating bridge. A legacy of the Ice Age, this lake is far too deep and the lake bottom too soft for a normal bridge. But Glacial Lake Washington was bigger. Three major Ice Age troughs sit between Seattle and the Cascade foothills. And an intricate network of spillways got established with fresh water being transferred from one glacial lake to the next as the Puget Lobe was leaving Seattle almost 17,000 years ago. Let's head east out of Seattle on Interstate 90. Driving from Seattle to North Bend hasn't always been so easy. Back in the 1920s, eastbound travelers heading for the Cascade Range took the Sunset Highway, a narrow two-lane road around the south end of Lake Washington, through Renton and the coal mines, and then on to Issaquah. But in the late 1930s, a major step forward. Two new tunnels were dug through the sands and clays of Seattle's Mount Baker Ridge, the largest diameter soft earth tunnels in the world at the time, and the world's first floating bridge built of reinforced concrete. The opening of the Lake Washington Bridge in 1940 meant an efficient escape from downtown Seattle due east out over Lake Washington and Mercer Island. Drivers were now cutting directly across the lay of the land. North-south trending hills sculpted by the Puget Lobe ice sheet during the last gasp of the Ice Age. And between those drumlins, equally impressive glacial troughs, long ditches carved by rivers of rushing meltwater underneath an ice sheet 3,000 feet thick. The deepest troughs still have water in them, Puget Sound, Lake Washington, and Lake Sammamish. 16,900 years ago, when the Puget Lobe was at maximum size, the weight of the ice pushed the land down by more than 250 feet the ice sheet plugged the drainage of the entire Puget Lowland. Rivers from the surrounding mountains, fresh water, were backed up at the ice front. The water was trapped, nowhere to go, unable to drain to the Pacific Ocean. At times, the lake was so large, it spilled south into the Chehalis River and got to the Pacific that way. But as the ice began its retreat to the north, the glacial lake scene started to change. Spillways got established. Floods of fresh water being transferred from one trough to the next. Seattle lies at the edge of the deepest trough, but between Seattle and North Bend, three separate tongues of ice sat in three significant troughs. The ice retreat caused glacial lakes to form where the ice tongues had been. And then the freshwater transfer game from one trough to the next began. Eventually, the ice sheet retreated back to Canada, the Strait of Juan de Fuca was reopened, and the waters of the Puget Sound were connected once again with the salty Pacific Ocean. The only freshwater remains of the massive glacial lakes of the Ice Age? Today's Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish. Well, that's a cool story, but this is I-90 Rocks. How much of the story can you see from the freeway? Well, for starters, surely you've noticed a huge gravel pit in Issaquah at exit 17. This is the lakeside gravel pit, right next to Interstate 90 at Issaquah. It's an active mine. They're pulling sand and gravel out of this huge deposit. Much of the sand and gravel was already used to build Interstate 90 a few decades ago. 
Why is there so much sand and gravel here? It's an Ice Age deposit. It's not a moraine, though. This is an Ice Age river delta, where an Ice Age river flowed into glacial lake Sammamish. River deltas form when rivers enter quiet bodies of water. The famous Mississippi River Delta in Louisiana is made of silt. But here in Issaquah, the delta is made of sordid sand and even gravel, a fast-moving Ice Age river, one of those spillways between glacial lakes. In this case, glacial lake Snoqualmie overtopping its rim and spilling southwest through surrounding uplands toward glacial lake Sammamish. So how can we be sure this is a river delta? Couldn't it be a moraine or something else during the Ice Age? It's the bedding here. These are inclined beds of sand and gravel, four set beds in the guts of this river delta. Here's how it works. Ice Age River coming into glacial Lake Sammamish. The river's bringing sand and gravel, but the sand and gravel is being dumped as the river's going into the lake because the speed of the river is dropping to nothing. Each new batch of sand and gravel is getting dumped down the face of this delta underwater, big avalanches of sand and gravel, and therefore the delta continues to grow, continues to build out into the lake. And the height of the delta is the height of Glacial Lake Sammamish long ago. Up on top of the delta, there's a nice flat bench. That's the old shoreline of Glacial Lake Sammamish. That's Lake Sammamish today. During the Ice Age, Lake Sammamish was up to here. This was the lake level. Beachfront property at that lake during the Ice Age right here. Wood fragments from the bottom of the delta have been dated at 15,500 years old. In 1991, a 14,600-year-old log was found near the top of the delta, so this gravel deposit took about 1,000 years to build when Ice Age lakes ruled here. These guys won't be running out of gravel anytime soon. The entire tradition plateau is one big Ice Age river delta, one of many Ice Age river deltas that rim the Puget Lowland. The elevation of the delta tops are consistently 120 feet above today's lakes. At the crest of Eastgate, look east across the Lake Sammamish Basin to see the high water mark of Glacial Lake Sammamish. I-90 climbs up two major Ice Age spillways. Heading east at exit 11, you know the climb, that's a spillway. Water spilling west from Glacial Lake Sammamish down into Glacial Lake Washington. And the freeway climb after passing the gravel pit and leaving Issaquah? Another spillway. This one from Glacial Lake Snoqualmie down into Glacial Lake Sammamish. Approaching the base of the Cascade Range, bedrock outcrops begin appearing along I-90 and we arrive in the North Bend area. From the top of Rattlesnake Ridge, terrific views of Mount Si and the three forks of Snoqualmie River converge here. Snoqualmie Valley flooding is still a problem at times. And where the river cascades over ancient volcanic bedrock, gorgeous Snoqualmie Falls is just a few miles from I-90. At the foot of Mount Si, one more significant Ice Age landmark of the Puget Lowland. This ridge that looms over I-90 is important. It's a glacial moraine composed of poorly sorted loose rocks that formed at the edge of a glacier. But which glacier? Ice that flowed down I-90 from Snoqualmie Pass? Or the ice sheet that pushed over Seattle from British Columbia? Dig into the moraine and you'll find rocks from Canada, not rocks from the Cascades. The Puget Lobe the same ice sheet that filled much of the Puget Lowland crept way over here to North Bend, pushed its way up this valley. And the Grouse Ridge Moraine marks the eastern edge of the ice sheet. But there's more here than just a moraine. This is another pit, another active mine using Ice Age rocks. But how is this pit different 
than back in Issaquah. Remember, in the pit in Issaquah, we had bedded deposits, layered foreset beds, an Ice Age river going into a glacial lake. This is different. Here at North Bend, we're at the edge of the Puget Lobe along the ice margin. We don't have those sloping beds. The beds are horizontal. They're sorted. And there's also huge glacial erratics all through this deposit. It's kind of a pain in the neck for the miners to get this sediment out to work around these huge boulders. Specifically, this is a moraine and outwash complex. And the surface of the outwash is beautifully flat. So coming away from this morainal ridge, we have this beautiful flat bench, the outwash of Grouch Ridge. Within all these rocks from Canada, not from the Cascades. The Puget Lobe, many times during the Ice Age, blocked Cascade rivers draining the mountains. So we had glacial lakes ponded along the edge of the outwash. Rivers bringing sorted rocks from both directions, off the ice and also down from the Cascades. The glacial deposits here clearly state that at the end of the Ice Age, the Puget Lobe and the Cascade Mountain glaciers were not in sync. During the last ice sheet advance, alpine glaciers in the Cascades were already retreating back into the mountains. So the I-90 drive from Seattle to North Bend has tons of Ice Age geology, but there's another story here that goes back even further into our past and is likely part of our future. The Seattle Fault, a significant east-west crack in the bedrock, runs right beneath the freeway here. The bedrock layers have been vertically offset by thousands of feet. The Seattle Fault has generated hundreds of earthquakes. The fault is responsible for at least four magnitude 7 earthquakes in the past 2,500 years. And there is concern for the future. Plate tectonic forces responsible for past Seattle Fault earthquakes continue to squeeze the crust. The most recent quake caused the bedrock south of the fault to jump up suddenly 21 feet about 1,100 years ago. Between Bellevue and Issaquah, have you ever noticed how the freeway runs along a boundary with ridges on the right and lowlands on the left? Earthquakes on the Seattle Fault created this. Each quake on the fault lifted the Issaquah Alps a little higher and dropped the basin a little lower. The hard bedrock on display south of I-90 includes 30 million year old volcanic rocks and siltstones of the Blakely Formation. North of I-90, the bedrock is buried by thousands of feet of soft sediment that is prone to seismic shaking. In Bellevue, I-90 crosses Mercer Slough, a thousand feet of very soft peat soil. Earthquake ground shaking is expected here. In response, the Washington State Department of Transportation has been seismically retrofitting this stretch of I-90. Overpass columns have been reinforced with steel jackets, and cross beams under the freeway have been secured with fixed blocks of concrete. Engineers and geologists working together to help prepare us for the future. How can we be sure there was an earthquake 900 AD on the Seattle Fault? All sorts of different kinds of evidence point to the same conclusion. In the bottom of Lake Washington, there's a dense forest that's in the lake. Landslides went into the lake, brought the trees with them. The trees have been dated 900 AD. A buried log has been found at West Point, north of Seattle, Discovery Park. The log sits in sand. The sand's been interpreted as a tsunami generated by the 900 AD earthquake. Charcoal from bogs on Bay Bridge Island tree rings from trees that were killed by rock avalanches on the Olympic Peninsula. Plus, it's not just the Seattle Fault, the Tacoma Fault and the Saddle Mountain Fault over by Hood Canal all talk about a 900 AD earthquake, shallow levels in the crust in the Puget Sound. Also at the bottom of Lake Washington, old wooden coal cars sitting upright on the lake bottom, still loaded with coal. What happened here? 
In January of 1875, a barge containing 18 coal cars was rounding the northern tip of Mercer Island when strong winds tipped the barge and sent the cars plunging to the bottom of the lake. The coal came from 40 to 50 million year old sedimentary rock layers below the Blakely Formation in the Issaquah Alps. The bedrock in the uplifted side of the Seattle Fault. Newcastle, once the second largest city in King County, produced more than 200,000 tons of coal annually at its peak in the 1880s. To bring the coal from the Newcastle mines to Seattle, the coal was loaded into wooden cars and sent on rails to the eastern shore of Lake Washington. The cars were barged across the lake to the western shore near present-day Husky Stadium. Unload the barges, more rails, then another barge across Lake Union and through Seattle to the docks. By then, the coal had been handled 11 different times. The coal was regularly shipped as far south as San Francisco, California. Seattle provided 22% of the coal produced on the Pacific coast at the time. With coal, Seattle was able to stand out from other Puget Sound towns that relied mostly on lumber. Today's Issaquah Alps are very popular areas for Seattle hikers and bikers. But there's a geologic reason these uplands have very few condos, malls, or housing developments. Cougar, Squawk, and Tiger Mountains are riddled with old coal mines. More than 50 mines, many multi-storied, are now sealed underground for safety reasons. The mine shafts, now filled with groundwater, have rotting timber supports. Development has not been allowed above many of the old mines because of the danger. Coal mining in the Seattle area, an important, often forgotten chapter between Seattle and North Bend. Well, we made it to North Bend, Seattle to North Bend, through all that Ice Age geology in the Seattle Fault. Let's head up into the Cascades for our next episode, up this glacial valley, up and over Snoqualmie Pass, and look at the Cascade geology. That's next up. Thanks for watching this one. Onward to the east we go. This is Snoqualmie Pass, easily the most heavily traveled mountain pass in all the Pacific Northwest. I-90 crosses the Cascade Range here. Let's take a little trip from North Bend up and over Snoqualmie Pass to learn old stories from the bedrock, the landforms, and even days of early human travel up and over the range. Remember from our last episode of I-90 Rocks, heading east out of North Bend means climbing Grouse Ridge, a complex of glacial till, glacial outwash, and glacial erratics from the Puget Lobe, the thick ice sheet from Canada that covered Seattle. But I-90 East here uses a valley sculpted by glacial ice that flowed down from the mountains, alpine ice, not an ice sheet. The freeway goes up the south fork of the Snoqualmie River and then down the Yakima River on the other side of the pass. Both valleys were under alpine ice many times during the Ice Age. But in the North Bend area, the mountain glacier was already melting back into the mountains when the Puget Lobe, the ice sheet from Canada, arrived for the last time 16,900 years ago. 
As you drive the 30 miles from North Bend to Snoqualmie Pass, alpine glacial deposits are mostly concealed by a dense forest cover. But in the high country, glacial erosional features abound. McClellan Butte, a glacial horn was shaved by ice. And Huckleberry Mountain. And Chickaman Peak. Their beauty is a direct result of glacial erosion. And U-shaped valleys, a classic signature of alpine ice, are on display. But something's missing up here at the pass. Where are the cirques? So this is the usual scene in a mountain range with alpine glaciers. Ice flowing in both directions away from the crest of the mountains. Ice is carrying rocks, plucking rocks away from the bedrock. And as the glaciers continue to erode, they leave steep walls. So when the ice melts back, we have a cirque on one side and a cirque on the other. Big bowl-shaped cuts that the glaciers eroded away from the bedrock. Two steep walls on the backs of both cirques is the usual scene. So to build a road up and over the pass, usually you have to get up and over these back-to-back -back cirque walls. Snoqualmie Pass is different. Snoqualmie Pass is lower because More than a thousand feet of glacial ice crossed the divide in this part of the Cascade Range. There's no steep wall. There's no big cirque. Right at the divide, right at Snoqualmie Pass, a thousand feet of ice crossing from west to east. Here's the map that will help us. Two glaciers flowed toward the pass from the north. Glaciers formed in the valleys of what is now Source Lake and Commonwealth Creek. The glaciers merged at the base of Guy Peak. The now bigger glacier flowed down to Snoqualmie Pass, and then right at the ski area, the ice split again. One tongue of ice dropped to the west, down to North Bend. The other ice tongue flowed right over Traveler's Rest at the pass and headed down the Yakima River Valley to the east. The ice disobeyed the drainage divide and did its own thing. Impressive. All of that ice is gone now. The Yakima River today takes the scenic route to the Pacific Ocean, east to Ellensburg, south to Pasco, and then finally west through the Columbia River Gorge to Portland, and then on to the ocean. But the Cascades have a much longer history than the Ice Age. World-famous, cone-shaped volcanoes, fueled by ocean floor subduction, has been steady here for tens of millions of years. But Mount Rainier is only half a million years old, and Mount St. Helens, much younger than that. State of Washington, Cascade Range. It's a volcanic mountain range with 40 million years of history of volcanic eruptions. These are the five cones we have today. Mount Baker, Glacier Peak, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, and here's Snoqualmie Pass in I-90 cutting right through that scene. There's a 40 million year history, but each of these cones have been standing for less than two million years. Cones have a two million year lifespan. So if we go back over the last 40 million years, there are other locations where cones used to stand. They've been carefully mapped out. Dozens of old places where cones used to stand, they've been eroded away completely, and these five are the ones we have to enjoy during our time on the planet. So I-90 travelers cross through the Cascades without ever seeing a volcano. But looking for coarse-grained granite has its advantages. So how do we know where these cones used to stand. If they're completely gone, how do we know where they used to be? The answer is the magma chamber. Magma chambers feed active cones. It's the plumbing supply. The magma is feeding the volcanic eruptions. But if we remove the heat, the magma turns to stone. And when we erode the cone, magma chamber rock is right at the surface. 
often accompanied with uplifts. You can have a mountain range composed of this rock that formed down below in a magma chamber. That's the scene in many places where the cones used to stand. I-90 travelers drive right through one of those old magma chambers, the Snoqualmie Batholith. Much of the bedrock west of the summit is granite that was once molten, supplying magmas to volcanoes 25 to 17 million years ago. A huge batch of magma chamber rock? That's a batholith. The beautiful granite has coarse mineral grains of feldspar, mica, hornblende, and quartz. The minerals are big due to the slow cooling of the magma deep underground. And there are more exposed granite batholiths north of the Snoqualmie Pass area all the way to Canada. Huge magma chambers compared to the plumbing systems beneath our majestic cones today. East of the summit, rock blasting has been an annual summer tradition to straighten out some troublesome I-90 curves. Digging and blasting has been a full-time job to make room for additional lanes, straighter stretches, and safer travel through this zone that is prone to rock falls and snow avalanches. What are they blasting here? More granite of the Snoqualmie Batholith? Nope. These are older andesite lavas and dense welded tufts of the Ohanapakash Formation. Volcanic layers that are typical south of the pass clear down to Oregon. Volcanic deposits from explosive volcanoes that died long ago. These aren't magma chamber rocks. These rocks record volcanic eruptions between 33 and 27 million years ago. The deposits outlived the volcanoes that made them. Here along I-90, dangerous rock falls have been a regular occurrence. The bedding planes and fracture sets in the bedrock are tilting toward the highway. Highway engineers and geologists have been working together to improve safety along this stretch of I-90. Huge blocks of rock are being removed, and to secure the remaining bedrock, deep anchors are drilled into more stable rock behind the fractured faces. Wow, what a challenging place to work! A narrow path between Lake Ketchelis and the rock wall, thousands of vehicles each day driving right through your work site. There's a long history here of trying to squeeze a road into this narrow path between Lake Ketchelis and the rocky ledge along the shore. And before that, water navigation across Ketchelis was required. And before that, no vehicles of any sort through here. For centuries, Native Americans used a narrow footpath to cross the Cascades at Snoqualmie Pass. Much of I-90 follows the old trail used by the Snoqualmie people and the Yakimas. The Indians told of deep snows, tens of feet deep at the pass, a product of the rain shadow effect. West of the pass, the forests were so dense that sunlight seldom touched the earth. Huge trees towered hundreds of feet above the forest floor, locking their branches together overhead and shutting out the sunlight. Early white explorers in the 1850s, searching for a possible wagon road and maybe even a railroad, looked hard for a suitable place to cross the mountains. A decade later, wagons rumbled over the old Indian trail through the pass. On the west side, sections of the valley floors were bottomless quagmires, impossible to cross without corduroy, split wooden planks laid over the muddy bottoms. And then in the first two decades of the 20th century, a new era came to Snoqualmie Pass. The very first automobiles somehow got through on the rough, primitive wagon road. The Milwaukee Railroad completed a line over the pass, and then an impressive new two-mile tunnel through the ridge opened in 1914, which cut off four miles of track and a steep climb for the trains. Reliable year-round travel over the Cascades was now a reality by rail. Thousands of people began enjoying the mountain grandeur in the summer by taking the train from Seattle and picnicking at Lake Ketchelis. And the construction of the railroad quickened the interest in an improved road over the summit, especially now that the horseless carriage was now on the scene. The Sunset Highway, 
Washington's first passable automobile road between western and eastern Washington was opened, but the early cars weren't exactly reliable. Inns were situated every 10 miles or so. And keeping the road open in winter was a major challenge. The first year the pass was open all winter? 1932. Plans for more lanes of traffic were begun in the late 1960s, but environmental concerns resulted in changes to construction techniques. The Franklin Falls Denny Creek Viaduct used a movable scaffold system without ground support to preserve the forest and mountain landscape as much as possible. The new elevated stretch of I-90 was completed above the falls in 1981. Think of all the travelers through time that have passed below Guy Peak, a sentinel that watches over Snoqualmie Pass. It's not a volcano, it's not a lava flow, or part of a granitic batholith. It's not even igneous rock. Guy Peak is made of sandstone that predates the formation of the mountains themselves. So the Cascade Range, how long has it been around? 40 million years but there are rocks that are older than 40 million years. Sitting on top of old bedrock, there's a thick deposit of sandstones and shales that were deposited between 55 and 40 million years ago. When Washington was a flat place, there were no major mountains. These are thick sands, shales, clays, coal beds that stretched across from west to east. This is the whole state of Washington here. But when the Cascades began, magmas from below worked their way up through the middle of this picture and volcanic activity started. So we have those sedimentary rocks to the east and west of the Cascades and occasionally you can find little remnants of these sandstones within the Cascades. That's Guy Peak, part of this sedimentary cover that predates the development of the Cascade Range. The sandstone of Guy Peak is clearly much higher than it was when Washington did not have the Cascades. There's been serious tectonic uplift here. The Juan de Fuca plate has been slowly bashing in the leading edge of the North American plate, a collision which has forced more than 2,000 feet of uplift in the last few million years. And more than old sandstones and magma chamber rocks have been revealed by the uplift. Down by North Bend, Mount Si's oceanic Metagabro bedrock requires tens of miles of movement inland and thousands of feet up. Franklin Falls, west of the summit, exists due to stubborn metamorphosed lava rock, also with an oceanic history that has since been uplifted. Denny Mountain is a huge block of marble, another metamorphic rock hanging out high in the Cascades. So many misplaced blocks of exotic bedrock up here that have stories of their own. And the pass lies at a newly discovered boundary. Central Washington University operates a dense network of high-precision instruments that have been drilled into bedrock all across the Northwest. The Pacific Northwest Geodetic Array, Panga, closely monitors tiny movements in the crust. Together, the GPS stations have revealed a new way to look at the Snoqualmie Pass region. So all those GPS stations of the Panga network are across this map, and these are the results. There's a beautiful, graceful, clockwise rotation of the crust in the Pacific Northwest. These yellow arrows, the longer the arrow, the faster the motion. Everybody's rotating around Pendleton, Oregon for some reason. And it's like the old game of crack the whip. You come around the outside, you're moving faster than the guys in the middle. But not everybody is rotating. This northeastern part of Washington is stable. It's part of the Canadian buttress that's not playing this rotation game. So right here at Snoqualmie Pass and the Hayak station, the GPS station from Panga that's showing still a little bit of motion to the northeast, we're crunching the crust, rotating block, into non-rotating block, tons of faults, tons of folds. It explains most of the topography in central Washington. Plus, the newly discovered clockwise rotation of the Northwest offers an elegant solution to an old Cascades volcanism question. 
Cone-shaped volcanoes in the Cascades, why do they exist? There's a subducting one to Fuca Plate and magma is rising to the surface. On a map, the cones are in a beautiful line stretching through the Pacific Northwest. That's today, but 16 million years ago, and this has been known for a long time now, the line of cones was different. And the line switches to the east of the Cascades right here at Snoqualmie Pass. Nobody could explain this pattern until recently. Until when? Until we discovered this clockwise rotation of the Pacific Northwest. We're rotating the crust over magma coming up from the subduction zone. New instruments solving old questions. Young volcanoes replacing older ones. An Indian foot trail, a wagon road, the Sunset Highway, and now Interstate 90. Amazing changes in just a few decades. Today, crops grown in eastern Washington's Columbia Basin Irrigation Project are trucked every day to Seattle's ports using Snoqualmie Pass. And the Mountains to Sound Greenway, first envisioned in 1990, was founded to work toward a shared vision of keeping some of these natural lands intact along the I-90 corridor through the Cascades. Well, we're up and over the pass, looking back at Snoqualmie Pass. There's the road construction site, the U-shaped valley. Remember that Yakima Valley Glacier flowing east? That's where we head next. How far east did that glacier travel? Does Ketchelis Lake have anything to do with that glacial activity? Onward to Cleellum and the coal mines, east of here. Thanks for watching. Welcome to Ellensburg in the Kittitas Valley, smack dab in the middle of the great state of Washington. Have you been to Ellensburg before? It's more than just a pit stop for I-90 travelers, you know. There's a downtown just a couple miles off the freeway. There's a beautifully restored historic downtown here and the Ellensburg Rodeo and Central Washington University. This valley is home to ranchers, outdoor enthusiasts, and university types. In this episode, let's talk about where is the end of the line for that Cascades Glacier. Let's talk about how the Kittitas Valley formed. And let's talk about a long ago volcanic eruption that produced the famous Ellensburg Blue Agates and gold deposits up by Liberty. The Kittitas Valley on I-90 Rocks. Well, that's the look at the I-90 drive from Cleellum through the Kittitas Valley and those beautiful blue agates to up here at the rest area at Ryegrass Summit. Great view of Mount Rainier on the western skyline from right here, overlooking the Kittitas Valley. That's the Emmons Glacier on our side of the mountain, the largest glacier in the lower 48 states. From up here at Ryegrass, we're going to head east. Apparently, there's lava flows up ahead. We're going to descend down to the Columbia River, the town of Vantage, and get our first taste of the Ice Age floods. Hey, thanks for watching our program. On to the next one. Younger advances were thicker. Damn it. Here we go. The different ter- oh, the thing. Go ahead. The only thing you missed there is not saying that they didn't come as far that you've said before. That they were we need, and we need to do that. That's, the, that's one of the main reasons yeah. we're looking from the side. Yeah. Okay. By the Vantage Lavas and Yellowstone National Park. Walk off home run. Walk off home run. You're done. Everything I kept thinking he needs to say, he needs to say, you didn't miss. Okay. 
So these different terraces are really interesting, but they're complicated, so let's give it a try. Here's the Yakima Valley Glacier coming down from Snoqualmie Pass, sometime older than one million years ago. And the top of the ice matches the top of the outwash. These are river-deposited gravels coming off, a meltwater coming off of this retreating ice. Okay, fine. If we retreat the ice back and we erode a bunch of the material out of the center of the valley, the next advance of the Yakima Valley Glacier is going to be not as thick and the ice is not going to travel as far. This is going to make a second terrace that is lower in elevation. But this advance is younger. This is a half a million or older. So an older ice advance, a younger ice advance. This terrace is at 2,000 feet elevation, whereas the older terrace was 200 feet higher. We're going to continue. We're going to erase much of that material in the center of the valley. And the next advance of the Yakima Valley Glacier is going to be thinner and not travel as far yet. You get the idea now, right? Now we're down to 1,800 feet with a younger set of outwash gravels, meltwater coming off the front of this ice. This glacier has been carefully dated at 140,000 years ago, and the terminus is right at Indian John rest area, car. So these different terrace levels in the Kittitas Valley are really cool, but it's kind of a tough concept, so let's give it a try. This is the Yakima Valley Glacier, the oldest and thickest advance. The southwestward motion of the North American plate over the hot spot gives us this pattern. Car. We could live with it if just like that. the bird was cool. <laughs> Some dispute this. Bring it down. I want to look at the river band you got yeah. in the front of that thing. Okay. All right, we're all set. Yeah, it's true. There's lava flows here at Vantage, Washington. Would you believe me if I said they're related to the volcano in Yellowstone National Park? A super volcano here has something to do with the lavas in central Washington. How's that possible? Here's how. Before that, these monster lava flows that were 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit? Crazy stuff here in the Vantage area. Kind of a tough act to follow. But that's coming next. The Quincy Basin is our next episode to the east. With the right viewpoint, the Quincy Basin has some great geology as well. Let's go there. Thanks for watching this one. What about one more in addition to the frigid floodwater monster, some big icebergs sitting in the... Good. So here in Vantage, think of all this stuff we're talking about. 700 feet of frigid water from the Ice Age floods, docked icebergs up into these side canyons, lava flows, burying forests, petrified wood. In the Vantage area is a pretty tough act to follow. But we do have more episodes. We're still heading east. Our next episode is in the Quincy Basin. Great stuff there too. Thanks for joining us here. On to the east to the Quincy Basin episode. That one works, doesn't it? Check, 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 check. Mount Stewart traveled. How's that even? Here we go. Mount Stewart traveled? It used to be in a different location? How's that even in pot? God damn it. Here we go. How do you move a mountain? How is it possible that Mount Stewart actually traveled?
to its present location. Granite is so the answer. Yeah. Just because of, to me it seems mm -hmm. like we've got traveling's another issue and how this stuff moves. Okay. This is how we know. And I know what you just said, but okay. mostly this is how do we know okay. that it's from another place? Okay. Not how did it why did it travel? Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. <laughs> The granite of Mount Stewart and the Stewart Range is in the middle of this ongoing debate about moving crust. Here's the idea. Granite forms underground, originally liquid magma, and as that magma cools slowly underground in the dark, minerals crystallize. And granites are famous for their randomly arranged minerals. The minerals have a random distribution as the magma hardens into bedrock, but there's a tiny black mineral called magnetite. And the magnetite grains are all parallel to each other because they're magnetic. They align themselves with an invisible magnetic field of planet Earth. And the orientation of these magnetite grains can help geologists decide exactly which latitude the granite crystallized at. There's a group of geologists that are sworn to secrecy. That's wrong. It's top secret. That's why we put it on YouTube. <laughs> it's only allowed, to be, talk, it's only allowed to be talked about on YouTube. <laughs>